the telco SIG and I've turned the recording on so everybody should be aware that this event is recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel for the playlist for the telco SIG folks for people who couldn't join us today. So um, I'm going to flash over to the agenda here and if you're on the call if you can add your, your name and your affiliation into the um, the notes here. Um, we'll just save them for posterity and post them on the mailing list for transparency. And today we have um, a guest speaker from um, the product management group uh, of um, the OpenShift team, uh, Mark Curry, who many of you may already know. So um, we've asked him to come and talk about um, Kubernetes network transformation. So myself and Paul Lancaster are, are the, um, the co-chairs for this event and um, before we get going too far, I was just going to mention that there are two upcoming events. There's a telco panel at the OpenShift Commons gathering, um, and there are a number of interesting folks who are on that. However, if you're not already have a ticket for it, it is sold out. But the good news is we will record all of the sessions there and upload them again to YouTube, um, and as well as we'll be live streaming the event. Um, so if you are so inclined, and have Facebook, you can watch along with us and um, and see how the day goes. So that's the other, and there's also upcoming a week from now at Summit, um, a telco day, the same day, May 6th, um, in another room there that will post the, the link to that too. So there's gonna be a lot of telco-ness going on on May 6th, um, and we're all sort of getting ready for that. So. Paul, do you have any other further words before we get started with uh, our event? I know you're the moderator for that panel, so. Um. Yeah, no, I just uh, you know look forward to seeing people there. Um, I will be, as Diane mentioned, moderating a panel of customers uh, who are using OpenShift um, or containers in some way within their, um, or containers in Kubernetes in some way within their telecommunications service provider a network side of their business mostly network side of their business so um, uh, I think it's key that you know a lot of the a lot of the innovation that we're trying to bring to uh, to open shift via what mark is doing and what mark's team is doing uh, is around fast data innovation um, so that you know folks can use things like OpenShift uh, to build and deploy applications meant for the network side of the house. So um, I will be chairing that panel. And then of course, for what part I'm not at OpenShift Commons, I will be over at the Telco Partner Day. And then of course, if anybody would like to meet during a Red Hat Summit, you know, I'm, I'm available at various times. So, um, you know, you can always reach, get in touch with me. I'll put my, I'll put my name and information in the chat window. Um, for those who would like to email me and, you know, uh, get, get a chance to, to meet. Yeah, and I think um, the other thing I forgot to mention is um, there will be an OpenShift Commons booth in Community Central at Red Hat Summit, um, and I'm going to force Paul to come and hang out with me there for an hour, and we'll post the times for that um, so the telco meet can have sort of a um, meet and greet there as well. I've kind of scheduled the whole thing so that it would be um, – Lots there, and if you're, if anyone else is interested in hosting um, and coming, who's an OpenShift Commons member, um, it's kind of my trick way of staffing the booth is getting members to come and hang out with me for an hour and um, talk about whatever they're in, into um, with people who come to the booth. So there's that opportunity. So without further ado, um, because I want to make sure we use Mark's time wisely. Uh, Mark, how about if you take over the screen sharing and let's kick off your talk now. Sure, sounds good. Let me go ahead and get that started. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Go for it. Yes, Great. we can. Okay, so um, thank you for uh, for joining me today. Um, what I'd like to do is present this. Uh, this is something that uh, I worked on in collaboration with uh, Dana Nihama from uh, Intel. 
Um, we've been collaborating quite heavily with Intel, um, Red Hat and Intel together on a number of different solutions that uh, are helping to enable telco in in the in in their transformation to a next generation uh, technologies and infrastructure deployments. So uh, this is actually a, a reprisal of something that we presented at Open Networking Summit about a month ago. Um, and uh, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what it is we're doing to to help with that and drive some of that network transformation that has to happen specific to the work that's going on in uh, Kubernetes. So uh, let's talk a little bit first about enabling the end-to-end -end network transformation. So um, how our technology has been deployed yesterday is really being uh, completely redone for how it's gonna be deployed tomorrow. Um, this is happening gradually in some places and at an extremely fast pace in other places in the technology. Um, unless you've been hiding under a rock for the past year or two, you already grasp the importance of building out digital cloud-based experiences for your customers and how those applications and the software, um, even those used as internal services for your workforce, can help improve offline experiences for your customers. So uh, our customers are familiar with the value of cloud computing and Kubernetes. Um, and so while OpenShift, uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm a product manager for OpenShift and I focus a lot on the container infrastructure for it. And that, in, that includes especially networking um, as well as other components. But uh, so while OpenShift does a tremendous job of harnessing these tools, um, our customers are also looking to us to help them with the next steps. So they wanna be able to build out intelligent applications with new technologies to deliver even better experiences for their users and, and even more value to their business. And, and this applies directly to what's happening in the 5G market today. So to sustain growth and rapid time to market, we have to transform the way we've always done things. And so this can roughly be broken down into three different transformations that have to happen. And so um, we first have to transform our business how we can plan for and sustain the expected scale and growth opportunities of an increasingly complex and populous market that's, that's really global in, in scope. Um, we require a network transformation. So we, we have to change the way we think about our networking, and then it has to be flexible to adapt to new requirements quickly, um, be able to adapt to new technologies as they become available, has to be agile enough to adopt to these new just-in-time technologies, especially given the increasingly um, adopted world of open source solutions and the accelerated pace that that um, entails. And then also we need to be able to scale to massive numbers. Um, and then in, in the cloud side of things, we also require a cloud approach. So the days of a single data center solving a global market's requirements are gone. We need the ability to seamlessly integrate multiple cloud native solutions that provide an optimized um, geographical affinity to a global set of customers and partners. Um, so we also need to adopt cloud native practices. So what this means is that we want best in class solutions on each public and private cloud providers infrastructure and we want to avoid vendor lock-in. Um, we also want to optimize performance of our solutions by providing the ability to not only um, initially place, but to, to move some of our workloads to infrastructure that makes sense. Move it closer to where it's needed uh, geographically, move it to hardware that has the technology that's required, um, and so on. So um, our ecosystem of cloud partners uh, for OpenShift includes AWS, Azure, Google, um, GCP, OpenStack, vSphere, Bare Metal. You, you, um, but what we're doing is we don't want, and, and, and what our what people are telling us is they don't want to have to learn a new tool which is highly customized, highly specific to each one of those cloud providers. So the goal here is to provide a seamless, single pane of glass development and solution for delivering all the tooling. Um, and delivery mechanisms across the different clouds. 
So this is exactly what we're doing with OpenShift. Um, and we're partnering with Intel to deliver this on obviously the, the hardware technology that is um, involved. And um, I'll, I'll give you some, some more details in a few slides here on the roadmap of how exactly we're doing that. So how it is that we as an industry move through this transformation um, as we modernize the development of our applications is, is accelerating. So where, where we are today is in this yellow sort of boxed in area here. So we, we've, we've essentially mastered the bare metal, you know, single node, single data center server delivery. We've, we've done a great job with NFV um, on virtualized infrastructure. But now what we're doing is we're adding to, and in some cases migrating completely to, um, cloud ready and cloud native infrastructure. So um, we, you know, the, moving from or working in conjunction with virtualized network functions, we're now adding cloud, uh, excuse me, container ne uh, network functions to uh, deliver a much uh, greater scale and performance in some cases. Um, and then that is really the next step to breaking things down still further into microservices for even even greater adaptability and performance. So to get here, what do we need to do? So there's some key challenges that are required for this transformation. So the challenges can be roughly broken down into these six different segments here. So the first one being automation. Uh, to deliver at the scale that we're talking about and to deliver across different cloud providers, this is, this is beyond uh, a human being sitting at a computer and, and working with this for their day two operations. If we don't get to a place of fully automated, um, not only for the deployment, but the management, day two operations and management of the infrastructure, we're not gonna be able to meet this challenge. So um, automation is very, very important. Standardized interfaces. Um, as the technology changes, we can't, um, we can't be in a position where what we developed yesterday no longer applies tomorrow. We need to be able to build on standardized interfaces and APIs so that um, we can grow, um, we can uh, avoid vendor lock-in by, you know, so that the next new technology uh, will work across what, uh, in the same way that you've always expected it to with your additional other applications. Um, resource management, we, we need a, a new ways of, of understanding what it is we're deploying to. So I, I need to know as an operator, for example, which nodes in my clusters have the capabilities that I require, which ones have a certain amount of memory, which ones have a certain amount of CPU uh, power, which ones have um, SRIOV capable NICs. We need, we need that level of understanding in order to make a, an intelligent automated system that we can deploy to and manage. Um, we need data plane acceleration. So uh, this, this is, um, our needs are only going to grow. The amount of performance that we require is not static. This has to be able to uh, grow with the capabilities of the underlying technology. Um, platform security, we absolutely cannot compromise on that um, when we work on any of these other challenges. We need an enterprise quality solution where platform security is, is not something you disable to get something to work. We need platform security to be the default uh, so that um, you know, we can, we can um, continue to deliver on the promise of production quality applications. Um, and the other challenge is migrating to containers. So containers are just quite simply more agile than a virtualized machine is. Um, there's a number of uh, benefits, which um, I, won't, I won't expand upon here. It's easily to Google, easy enough to Google what all those advantages are, um, but suffice it to say that a number of our current virtualized network functions that we have today um, run far more efficiently when broken up into appropriately sized and developed uh, containers. So those are, the, those are the challenges to be addressed. Um, we have to match that to the platform technologies. And this is where we work with our partners like Intel and Mellanox and so forth 
to to make sure that we are developing for the hardware that's most common, most uh, prevalent in the cloud provider um, uh, data centers and on-prem data centers today. So we continue to work with our partners to make sure that we align closely to them. We also um, need to account for an accelerated ecosystem of solutions. So open source is uh, obviously Red Hat is all in on open source, but open source is uh, a far more accelerated mechanism for the delivery of the kind of solutions that we require. There are lots of options. Um, and so we need to be able to, in an agile way, uh, flex to include the technologies that are available, the best technologies that are available today, as well as be able to adopt the best in class that's going to be available tomorrow. And, and so open source is, is really the way to do that. Um, full transparency on how things work and APIs. And, and I, I think we have sort of general agreement in the industry um, on that. So I won't spend too much time there. So um, specific to containers. So here's where we get a little bit closer to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So what exactly are the challenges in containers? How, why, why are containers not ready for someone's um, Telco NFV uh, uh, solutions today? What are, what are we doing about that? Well, we can roughly break some of those challenges down into these four groups. Um, so the challenges being that Kubernetes networking. So Kubernetes uh, is the is the platform upon, for orchestration and management of containers that the industry has standardized on. And so what we, as a leading contributor um, to Kubernetes, do is we want to make sure that it meets the use cases provided for telco NFV. So um, what are those challenges? Well, so many of those um, I'll get into in just a moment, but uh, suffice it to say that for a while, Kubernetes has, um, Telco NFV has not been top of mind. And so what we're doing is we're changing that. As Kubernetes grows, we are um, bringing Telco NFV into Kubernetes as a first class citizen use case. And we are developing the technologies that are absolutely fundamental and required to developing those solutions. Um, so it's, it's networking in general, it's data plane acceleration. We need to make sure that containers um, have the ability to take advantage of uh, the types of bypass technologies that we've grown accustomed to in the data center. Um, and some of those, uh, quite frankly, did, had, just have not existed, but uh, I'm gonna talk about our progress there and where we're going to develop those. Um, resource management, again, we need to have this enhanced platform awareness if we're going to build out, build out intelligent day two operations and management infrastructure capabilities. Um, we need to know if you are using multiple clusters in potentially different geographic locations. We need to know when you initiate uh, or instantiate a new application, where should that be placed? Uh, we need to know what are valid platforms to which it could potentially be migrated uh, for reasons of um, disaster recovery, high availability, for reasons of potentially moving it closer to uh, where it's needed geographically um, and, and other reasons. So there's, we have to have this deeper understanding of what's happening um, in order to be able to, to meet those, those, uh, those solutions. And then finally, telemetry. So telemetry at the scale that we're talking about and across multiple clusters is something new that we're working on at Red Hat and uh, with Kubernetes. And so we can talk a little more about that. So the key challenges then maybe break them down still further. So you saw the enabling technologies in that middle column, but what exactly are those for? Let's, we'll talk a little bit about those. So Multis um, is the first one. One of the key things that we're talking to our customers in Telco NFE that, that they have said to us that they require is the ability to have multiple network interfaces for their traditional VNFs as de when deployed as containers or CNFs. So this, uh, in Kubernetes, there's only ever been a single interface for containers because there's quite frankly, hasn't been the need for anything more than a single interface. 
Uh, but for these new use cases, uh, we had to essentially enable this in upstream Kubernetes. This isn't a Red Hat thing. This is, this is we, we always do upstream first. So we developed it um, in conjunction with some of our partners and especially including Intel to deploy this in upstream Kubernetes. And, and, and we have in um, approximately uh, 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 three weeks or so, three or four weeks, we're actually gonna deliver upon this promise in a fully supported um, um, uh, platform enterprise version of OpenShift. I'll talk more about that in a moment. So Multis is our enabling technology. Multis was originally created at Intel and they've been great partners to work with us on that. The next one, uh, high performance data plane. We need this not only east west, uh, you know, between containers, between nodes, but we need this north south uh, into and out of our cluster. And so we are enabling the types of technologies, including SRIOV, user space, DBDK. Uh, we're enabling these types of technologies to help us with um, with those some of those issues. Um, failover and high availability of networking. So we're, we're working upstream very heavily with um, special special interest groups around CNI to develop on CNI. Um, the ability to request and allocate platform capabilities. So um, again, node feature discovery to learn more about the, the platforms that we're working on. Uh, CPU core pinning and isolation for Kubernetes pods. So if you want to achieve, for example, line rate performance, you can't have your application bouncing from core to core. Um, you take a hit every time you do that. Uh, the same thing is also true for a little bit further down there. Again, uh, NUMA awareness. Uh, we need to have that uh, in order to be able to be localized to, I um, have our memory localized to our applications. Um, dynamic huge page allocation. Some of these we've actually already solved in upstream Kubernetes, one of those being uh, huge pages. So we're, we're, we're well on our way um, to some of these. Um, and then finally, uh, platform telemetry information with CollectD and, and so forth. And so some of those, some details about where we are with some of those things are on the right hand side. So um, the work that we're doing, so again, we're collaborating pretty heavily with Intel, but um, understand that Red Hat is, um, is a top two con contributor um, to upstream Kubernetes. We do all of our development there first, um, and then we downstream it into our OpenShift product. So uh, in order to sort of steer the direction of this properly and to develop some of the things that were required for Telco NFB use cases, um, uh, in particular, we uh, initiated a, a new um, uh, group, uh, part of the networking special interest group, um, having to do with network plumbing issues. And so one of the first big successes that we had that was actually started a couple of years ago, um, we, it was a very long process to get to where we are, is one of our big successes was to produce a version one spec for how it is that we're going to do multiple networks, multiple interfaces per uh, pod inside of a, um, um, a cluster. Um, and so, it, it, we finally released um, this year that uh, um, that approved, I'm sorry, at the end of last year at KubeCon, uh, we released that approved version one spec. And uh, again, um, in our next release of OpenShift, we're actually going to be providing that capability to have more than one interface per pod in an enterprise fully supported way. So what is, for example, Multis, how is it that it achieves that? So let me back up for a moment and explain a little bit about the way Kubernetes works. So Kubernetes has a container network interface or a CNI. Um, it's really nothing more than a specification and set of libraries for writing plugins to configure network interfaces in uh, Linux containers and pods. Um, and by the way, you've heard me sort of maybe interchangeably use containers and pods. For those of you that aren't comfortable with that difference, uh, pods are really just a logically grouped um, collection of containers that happen to share a common namespace. So, um, so for example, if you had multiple containers in a pod, they would all have that same uh, collection of interfaces. So, um, so the way it works is Multis is, um, Kubernetes only and ever traditionally has recognized that first interface that was plugged into the CNI 
Um, and so this is where traditionally the SDN would live. The SDN would get plugged in there. Whenever a new pod gets instantiated, the pod says, hey, how should my networking be configured? Um, it reaches up um, to Kubernetes for the answer to that question. Kubernetes queries the whatever's plugged into the CNI for that networking configuration information, and then that is delivered to the pod on that on that primary interface. Uh, we'll, we'll just call it ETH0 here. Um, so all con the problem with that is you can probably come up with your own reasons why that's a problem, but a major problem is that's where all the control and data plane traffic is flowing. There's not a whole lot of flexibility there. So um, what we did was we enabled, uh, again, working with Intel and upstream, we enabled Multis as a meta plugin for this Kubernetes CNI interface. Multis enables the ability to create multiple network interfaces per pod and assign a, a CNI plugin to each of those interfaces created. So on the right-hand side here, you see there is a, a second interface. Now you can have a third, fourth, fifth, however many you require, but in this case, we, we just have two plugins that are, notice how they actually are plugged into Multis, and then Multis presents this in sort of a unified multiplexed view to Kubernetes. Uh, so Kubernetes doesn't, didn't have to change. It still thinks there's only essentially one interface, one CNI plugin. Um, and, but under the covers, there is actually multiple that are being configured here. In this case, the secondary interface is, in this case, is a Mac VLAN plugin. Uh, the name is whatever you want it to be. In this case, it was, it happens to be set to net zero. Um, but, and we have a number of plugins, which I'll talk about in a moment, which we are going to support at the first, at the next release of OpenShift that you can plug in here. And that list of plugins is going to grow. Um, the use cases are are plenty for the types of plugins that are required. Um, after this presentation, if somebody says, "I, you know, if you have a use case that goes beyond a plugin that we've discussed, I'd, I'd love to hear about it." Um, so this is basically how Multis works, and this is how it enables this capability. So let's talk a little bit more about um, the near-term Multis roadmap. So this this really opens up a lot of doors for us. This is sort of a fundamental thing that is gonna enable a lot of new technology that is required or fundamental to telco NFT use cases. So the first one, um, first plugins that we are going to uh, fully support with the release of OpenShift 4.1 at the end of May um, are of course our default SDN, um, uh, but also we're gonna be adding uh, from the upstream reference uh, plugins, we're gonna be adding VLAN, Mac VLAN, host device, and IPAM DHCP. We're also going to be adding at uh, 4.1 a tech preview of um, SRIOV, uh, the CNI and device plugin. So um, SRIOV will be available at the end of May for people to try. We are initially targeting um, two very select cards, the most popular ones uh, from Mellanox and Intel. Um, and then we expect that stable of hardware that we function with and we've tested against to grow over time. Um, in, uh, in the next version of OpenShift 4.2, which is targeting the September timeframe of this year, um, we're gonna be adding um, the, uh, at least a couple more uh, plugins, including um, a VLAN enabled bridge plugin, as well as IP VLAN. Um, further on our roadmap, we have other high, you know, high value, high interest plugins, including uh, potentially adding Amazon and, and, and Azure cloud native plugins uh, for a cluster to take advantage of some of the native networking that, that is happening there. Um, this is further on the roadmap and requires, of course, some, some more uh, investigative work, uh, but this is something that's of interest to us. So where do we go from here? So you've heard me mention that this really opens a lot of doors, having the ability to add new plugins. Um, and you know a little bit about the technology behind Multis and how it might maybe does that. But let me tell you from a perspective of a product manager, there's a number of use cases that this really, really helps set the stage for, or, or in fact, might even solve altogether right out of the gate. 
Um, so some of those are listed here. I, I stopped when I got to the bottom of this screen, but, but that does not mean there's not, there's not more. There's plenty more. But these are some of the ones that are top of mind. So, for example, functional separation of control and data planes. As you saw, Kubernetes, um, again, with Multis, allows you to have more than one interface. Well, Kubernetes itself still only really recognizes that first primary interface for all of its control plane traffic. So in that sense, that first interface is uh, uh, focused on all of the control plane traffic for the cluster. What that means is that that second interface that you create can be entirely focused on data planes. So in this sense, you can have a functional separation of control data planes. If you use a technology like SRIOV on the secondary interface, that can be tied directly to a NIC. And you can bypass everything in one fell swoop and, and you can achieve that line rate performance. There's other things that need to be solved, as I mentioned, like NUMA awareness and CPU pinning and so forth in order to get that line rate, but we can we can get close to it even without those. Um, so that's one really huge thing. Another thing that uh, our customers are telling us that they want um, is, is to have greater control over who's allowed to access the hardware on the box. So we're working in, with upstream Kubernetes on admission controller um, uh, capabilities that would allow us to define who is allowed to use what interfaces, hardware interfaces on the host themselves. Um, we're working on uh, dynamic runtime enablement capabilities. So the ability to say on the fly, I would like to add this secondary or tertiary interface to my cluster without having to do a, essentially a network restart, which is um, where we're at today, or, or to do a greenfield, if, if, if depending on the technology. So we were adding those capabilities upstream. Uh, link aggregation for network redundancy. So the ability to, a lot of our customers are asking us for additional data plane interfaces that they can tie to NICs, which are then tied directly to top of racks, which is, um, and they use this again for aggregation and redundancy. So we're, we're solving that with, with the Multis technology. Um, this is gonna enable us to deploy different types of network protocol stacks, different SLAs, different capabilities. Um, we're also, in combination with the SDN that's being used, we're going to be able to offer increased traffic isolation, segregation, and security. Um, through additional plugins, we're going to be able to um, uh, work on uh, future things such as user space networking, for example, VPP and OBS DBDK. This is also going to help a lot in markets having to do with video streaming because we'll be able to offer instead of the low performance multicast, which is the default in Kubernetes today, um, which really designed for control plane traffic only, we're gonna be able to have these high performance secondary data plane interfaces that will enable um, new technologies or uh, such as video streaming, data streaming in general, um, using high performance multicast. Um, again, I already mentioned the SRIOV um, plugins that um, we're gonna tech preview at the end of this of, of May. Um, and uh, and we're going to get those to to GA fully supported as soon as possible. Uh, the things that we're holding back on right now, um, uh, things that are holding us back on GA at the moment, have to do with the CPU pinning and um, and the NUMA awareness that we're we're working very diligently on upstream in Kubernetes. We're going to also be able to enable things like QoS, right? So the different interfaces. You might want to use one of those that your secondary data plane interface to um, a direct tie to storage, maybe for backups. So we've got a number of customers that are concerned about that that storage or backup process consuming so much of the bandwidth that potentially it, it slows down or causes issues with control plane. Um, also, this is going to help us enable an, a technology which is forthcoming to uh, the, uh, in Red Hat, and that is container native virtualization, basically building on Kubert networking. If you're unfamiliar with that, that's the ability to run virtual machines and, and in a containerized cluster, uh, container cluster. Um, the virtual mean uh, virtual machines being treated just like any other container and being orchestrated by Kubernetes. So, um, and specifically, one of those plugins was the VLAN um, enabled bridge plugin, which is going to help uh, get us there. Um, also, we're looking at using Multis for things like SDN migration. 
So for those users that are, um, this is not uh, a proven technology, but we are definitely seeing some great successes with this. Um, uh, and, and, but the idea is that our customers, if they want to move from one SDN to another, um, then you could use Multis to instantiate a secondary interface, um, plug in your next generation SDN into that second interface, and then establish routes to move the workloads as you see fit from one SDN to the other. Uh, there's, that's tr very, very tricky. Um, but again, we are working on that. We are seeing some early successes especially for simple deployments. Um, and of course, we're not gonna rest on our laurels. So we got to a version 1.0 specification for Multis um, in upstream um, through this, um, this uh, network plumbing group. Uh, the network plumbing group is a collaboration now. I've, I believe we're upwards of around 20 different vendors that are all contributing to that. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent working group um, if you have not already checked it out. Uh, but we're building towards specification version 2.0 which will, in, will add a lot of functionality that help us get to the things that we can't get to uh, quite yet with 1.0. So uh, in summary, there's uh, quite a bit of network transformation going on and we're trying to enable the parts and pieces that are, that are required for that transformation. We're trying to enable in the new uh, container world uh, we're trying to enable those things that have become sort of an expectation, if not a requirement, uh, in in the traditional data centers and deployments for telco NFV. So uh, that's what we're working on, and um, and I've hit the end. Are there any questions? Well, I think you've done um, a great job covering a lot of territory. Um, so thank you very much. Out there. There actually haven't been too many questions. There was a little bit of um, back and forth around um, a few slides in around operational focus and what you meant by that. Um, but that was way back in the beginning. So I think maybe we can do that offline with Thomas. Yeah, uh, you know, real quickly on that, you know, just the, the idea of the operational focus is we want to bring, uh, we, we want to, we've always focused in OpenShift on the developer experience, and we excel at that. Uh, when we acquired CoreOS, we actually got a lot of new technologies and, and uh, that are are bringing the uh, an enhanced operational experience to OpenShift as well. So we have um, we, we've essentially now made the day two operations administration experience a first class experience in our platform today, uh, starting with. Um, uh, actually really starting with our version 3.11, but definitely in our uh, our next version, which is due out at the end of uh, next month. Lots of that in there. There's one question now from Brad Opperman. Yeah, yeah hi, hi, Diane, can you hear me? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah, so my question I popped there in the chat was, I was interested if you could speak to the mapping of these OpenShift developments, the roadmap in, in, in relative to OpenStack. I know there's a, an effort on uh, OpenShift has been integrated over you know, recently over into the OpenStack platform, and these new Multis developments, specifically you know, the uh, multiple uh, network interfaces that are going to be enabled in in the uh, OpenShift roadmap. Can you speak to the roadmap relating to OpenStack? Sure. Um, so the, our the OpenShift and OpenStack relationship has a few different. Um, uh, a few different uh, uh, deployments uh, or styles of deployment. So the first one is just plain Jane, literally OpenShift on top of OpenStack. Um, what you have is you have an SDN solution on top of another SDN solution. Um, that double encapsulation of packets uh, has been an issue for some of our customers. Other most of our other customers, it's really not that big of an issue. But um, but for those for for whom it is an issue. We actually used an enabling technology from the OpenStack side called Courier. And what we do is we take Courier and use it as the CNI plugin into Kubernetes. And you can think of Courier as an adapter. What happens is when a new pod is instantiated and it asks Kubernetes for how its networking should be configured, uh, Kubernetes asks its CNI plugin, how sh what should we do? Courier actually then says, let me reach all the way down to Neutron and whatever plugin it's using to provide that information to back to Kubernetes so it can configure the pod. 
So in that sense, we've we've sort of collapsed the SDN between the two. We've gotten rid of the double encapsulation, um, and so that's another way. Um, and and eventually, it's 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 going to be our well today, it's our best practices way of doing OpenShift and OpenStack. But specific to your question about how does that play with Multis, there's no reason why Multis couldn't have as its primary interface, uh, uh, essentially a courier enabled mechanism for the control plane, and then use another plugin for secondary tertiary interfaces. Um, it's also true that we could use courier technically. Um, this is not something that we have uh, tested uh, because this is all really quite quite new for us. Um, we are, we're just releasing, you know, some of the first implementations of it now. Uh, but the uh, there's there's technically no reason why Courier couldn't be deployed as the secondary data plane interface. So maybe Control Plane remains uh, within the OpenShift cluster using a default SDN, the one that comes out of the box, and potentially Courier would be the enabling technology for a secondary interface. So that if you needed something that's already perfectly functional for you or that you're using today at the OpenStack infrastructure layer, um, potentially you could just reach down with a courier for your, for your data plane to, to use that. Does that make sense? Does that, that answer your question? Yes, though I was thinking a bit about, so Maltus, the development that's going on with Maltus or multiple interfaces. Uh, uh, if I follow you correctly, you're, you you describe using Courier on OpenStack to provide multiple network interfaces. Uh, is Multis a plugin that will be transported uh, into OpenStack in a future release on OpenStack with the no. OpenShift integration? Okay. No, it would re it would remain at the Kubernetes uh, layer. So C Courier is a is a single interface only. Um, um, so, you know, you th think of Courier as the SDN that gets plugged in and takes care of that first interface uh, today on the pods. Um, but, and Multis would live, potentially, Multis would live between Courier and Kubernetes. So that in addition to Courier providing the information for that primary interface, Multis would say, would allow additional plugins that would serve to configure secondary tertiary interfaces on pods. But no, what the courier um, is is really, it has a very specialized purpose in life, and that is for that interface which is being configured, in this case, the default being the primary, for that interface being configured, I'm just gonna reach down to whatever plugin Neutron is using, um, and I'm gonna use that to configure the IP and so forth for the for the pod that I'm instantiating. Okay, thanks, Paul. Yeah, let me let me digest that and run with it. Yep, and happy to talk offline more if you have any questions. Yeah, I, I, I'll be up at the OpenShift comments. I plan on catching up with you there. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Are there any other questions from folks in the audience while we still have Mark um, before he goes back to prepping for Summit? This is, I mean, this is Paul Lancaster, Mark. I, it's not necessarily an audience question. It's kind of an insider question, but maybe the audience is also interested in this. It, um, a lot of this work that we're doing, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we're working with partners like Intel to do performance testing um, that we can share with communities. And so I'm wondering if you could maybe speak to what we're doing there to show how uh, the work that we're doing in communities like Multis and uh, Kubernetes um, actually is becomes meaningful to various, let's say, different use cases for telco uh, service providers, um, and what sort of testing we do there, and information we publish around it. If we if we do that at all, I, I just am wondering. Yeah, it's a great question, Paul. Um, so we have a number of different ways that we do that. So. Um, in fact, many of the numbers that you see published upstream in Kubernetes, those are actually numbers that were um, were, were actually created by Red Hat. So we have um, a performance and scale team that focuses on exactly that. 
And when they stand up massive clusters and basically see what, <laughs> at what point do things finally break, um, the, these limits, um, we publish those upstream and uh, for Kubernetes, and and then we we um, for downstream in OpenShift, we actually um, uh, instead we move away from maybe more theoretical kind of numbers to more practical limits of uh, of supportability. So there's really two kind of sets of numbers there. There's there's the theoretical limit. There's the practical limit at, beyond which um, a customer may not want to exceed. And and you know there's reasons beyond performance that might limit our recommendation. For example, you know, even though you might be able to do 500 nodes in a cluster, what is your, your um, liability footprint? You know, how many nodes are you willing to put in there? Um, uh, and you know, maybe, maybe your, your risk assessment is that you wanna cap that off at say 200 nodes. So there's there's other factors that come into play when we talk about some of the performance and scale. The actual performance numbers, of course, are un, um, unadulterated. We we publish those exactly. Working with our partners, um, we, they uh, they basically feed us hardware, and we put this into our labs, and we generate performance numbers that we th then publish. We are working very closely today with um, specifically with Intel and Mellanox on a number of their cards, um, and those numbers are actually in flight for many of the things that we're doing now, including um, SRIOV and Multis. And so expect to see those published um, at or just after the GA of the technologies. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I mean, the, the reason I ask is because a lot of, uh, you know, the customer base out there, the potential customer base, of course, is really winds up building you know, building their businesses on what ultimately they think they can get close to as far as the performance is concerned. So um, I think, you know, the work that we do there and the work that we're able to publish really helps us and helps the community. I agree. And and look for um, reference architecture designs uh, in the near future as well. When we get those, we'll make sure we come and have them presented here at the, the SIG and have some more further conversations about them. Um, I'm looking at the time now. Is there any other questions people might have? No, I'm going to take back the screen for a minute and share screen and just sort of walk through. Uh, Mark, uh, I think I found you on the schedule at Red Hat Summit talking about OpenShift high performance networking with SRI IOV. Is, is that you and in that which one of the theaters? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's actually myself and the primary engineer um, from CTO Networking that's working on that. Um, uh, Sangui, he, he's uh, uh, he and I will be co-presenting on that. Uh, he's the brains of the operation. I'm the, I'm just the product manager, um, but uh, I'm also going to be delivering a couple of panels on OpenShift roadmap. Um, yep. It's going to be um, uh, basically two instances of it, uh, simply because there wasn't a large enough room. No, no, I, I know. Have problems with the rooms at Summit. They're not big enough, and Summit keeps growing. The same with the Commons. So um, we'll look forward to that. I um, also wanted to mention that we are going to have um, a, tel -sig, a Telco SIG meet and greet up at the um, OpenShift Commons booth at on May 8th at 1 p.m., so prior to your talk. I think the theater you're in, is that the theater in the um, on the expo floor, Mark, or is that in an actual room? somewhere that uh, it's my understanding that it's on the expo floor okay so we'll all be out there on the expo floor um on there so if you'd like to come and meet up beforehand um paul and i will be around the commons booth in a community central also at 1 p.m so if you just want to hang out there that would be great um just to get some face time with some folks and other than that um, we look forward to talking with you again in another month at the next meeting, which I haven't looked up the date of the fourth Friday of each month. And if you have a topic, um, and we will be looking for, um, I think maybe Mark, if we could get Intel to come in and talk about uh, Multis from their point of view, maybe the Multis roadmap, um, that might be something that um, people would be interested in too as well. So. Um, to get another yeah well, we we share um yeah we I'm sure they would be happy to do that we do 
Um, we do share that. In fact, um, to a certain extent, Red Hat really uh, dictates the roadmap a little bit more since we're we're more product oriented than Intel is. Uh, Intel is more research oriented. Um, so we actually dictate that roadmap a little bit more. We could, but we could certainly work together to deliver a unified uh, 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 information about that. That would be great. So um, I think that's all we have for today, unless Paul, you have something else um, up your sleeve there. I don't. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to let people have all of eight minutes back before their next meetings or whatever it is they're going on to do. Um, and look forward to seeing most of you um, at um, the Commons event in, in Boston in a few weeks, or maybe at the Commons event at KubeCon EU in May um, and over in Barcelona, if you're so lucky as to get to come to Barcelona with us. Um, that would be great to see you there as well. And definitely find us um, at the OpenShift Commons booth in um, Community Central at Red Hat Summit and stop by and say hi if you have a chance. Right. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Mark, for taking the time.